Happy Monday, everyone. Um, yeah, let's get started. Um, I'm shocked. Biden has made a comeback. I still don't think he's going to win the nomination. I do think it's going to go to Sanders. But Pete Buttigieg, who I thought would be second, dropped out yesterday. Now, am, am I surprised? In a way, yes, because I expected him. I expected people to. I, I expected that there'd be others to drop out before him. That's what I expected. Um, he talked yesterday about, you know, it's about uniting the Democratic Party. And he said that's why he's stepping down. And I think it's interesting. I think it's interesting that he dropped. I think it's interesting that he dropped out. Like, Klobuchar is still in as of, you know, 1030 Monday morning. Elizabeth Warren, she's still in. Steyer dropped out, but no one, like, no one cared about Tom Steyer. Tom Steyer had no shot. He had no shot. What I did like about Tom Steyer, I did like some of his ideas, especially uh, limiting, t having term limits for politicians. I am a fan of that. I do like that, but that's, it's never really going to happen. Politicians really... When, see, here's the thing. When you give someone power, they don't really, they're not going to give it up willingly. They're not going to limit themselves. That's why you had things like the Magna Carta. Because people, when you, when you give them power, they don't give it back. People always will want more and more and more and more. When you give someone something, they're going to want more eventually. So term limits, that's, that's just not going to happen. It's not going to happen. Um... But Pete is out. Biden is still in. Tomorrow is Super Tuesday, and I'm very excited. I'm very excited. Um, I usually don't watch TV during the days. Um, I, if I do watch TV, it's at night, and I watch like game shows or the news with my family. Specifically, I watch Family Feud, and Wheel of Fortune, Jeopardy, and stuff like that. Um, but tomorrow, the TV is probably going to be on. Probably all day for me. Um, I'm, I'm, what, what's shocking to me. Now, here's what really helped Biden. Represent, Representative Clyburn, um, of South Carolina, he really, he's very, he's very influential over there. Um, his, that endorsement was huge for Biden. I think without that, we'd be having a different story today. Um, but, you know, Pete is out. And there was an article from NBC News. Um, and here it is. Uh, Pete Buttigieg dropped out of the presidential race and homophobia helps explain why. Okay. It seems so long ago that the first openly gay candidate won the Iowa caucuses. Mere weeks later, the Pete Buttigieg campaign is now past tense, as the former mayor of South Bend, Indiana, announced Sunday that he was dropping out of the race for the Democratic presidential nomination. Now, here's my question. How many people actually thought that Pete would win? Look, okay, forget the nom. Just, let's say he got the nomination. How many people actually thought he would become president? I don't think anyone did. I, I, I don't believe anyone did. Um, wherever that leaves Buttigieg and his future political prospects, or any future LGBTQ candidate, this moment affords us an opportunity to ask ourselves where the nation as a whole really is in terms of acceptance of LGBTQ, LGBTQ candidates. Now, let me say this. 2024, there's going to be a lot more openly gay um, openly gay, lesbian, bi, don't, I'm, I'm going to say this, don't be surprised to see a trans in 2024. Don't be surprised. Do not be surprised. Because I'm, I'm going to say this, man. Well, let me say this first about Pete. 
don't be surprised if he is asked to be someone's running mate. Don't be surprised of that. I could easily see him someone maybe maybe like Biden. I think Biden could I could see him asking Pete to be his uh VP. I could see that. And it wouldn't surprise me if that were to happen. To be clear, I'm not arguing that Buttigieg was unsuccessful because of homophobia. But lessons from this cycle do allow us to be honest about the challenges that LGBTQ candidates face. While these issues may not have gotten a lot of attention in 2020, Buttigieg's campaign demonstrates that how many problems of homophobia still remain. After Buttigieg won Iowa, I often heard things akin to homophobia not mattering much anymore. There were Rush Limbaugh's homophobic remarks. Sure, there was the Buttigieg voter in Iowa asking to have her vote back once upon learning that he was married to a man, but these were isolated incidents. No. All cycle, a Gallup uh, poll was used as an example of how accepting Americans had become with 76% of those surveyed saying they'd vote for a gay person for president. While that sounds high, that still means one quarter of the country admits that it's a non-starter, that a lot of votes lost right off the bat. Now, let me say this. Okay. In that same Gallup poll, I don't have it right in front of me, but I was looking at it, you know, over the weekend. And I, I actually referenced this this poll uh, earlier uh, in one of last, last week's episodes. But being a social... some. For, I think it's like 45% of voters would vote for a socialist. So, I mean, this guy's kind of talking about how, you know, how a quarter of the country admits that it's a non-starter, that they wouldn't vote for, you know, uh, a person who's not straight. Let me say this. 76% is high. That's still high. Because, see, there are certain things that are just plain un-American. And being a socialist is one of them. So with Pete being gay, um, aside aside from the immoral aspect, um, this this is this is pretty high. If you're going to look at it from the LGBTQ point of view, that rhymes. If you look at it from their point of view, your future is pretty bright in politics. No, I don't think anyone really thought Pete was going to get this far with his age, with him being openly gay, um, him only being mayor. He got really far. And I mean, he, he was he was up against some, you know, some giants, Sanders, um, Biden. Those are those are big names in politics. To be neck and neck with those guys and I mean to have a at one point have a lead over Biden is huge. Their future, the future for them from their point of view is bright. Now, here we go back to the article. And as any social scientist can tell you, that's a best case scenario rather than reality. If you ask someone if they're homophobic, racist, or sexist, we know there's a self reporting bias that minimizes the true extent of the problem. As many people aren't willing to admit they are either publicly or to themselves. No, that's a good point. So let's look at some of these realities of homophobia. It was only 2012 that North Carolina became the most recent state to pass a constitutional amendment against same-sex marriage. While nationally 68% of people that year said they'd vote for a gay candidate, fewer than 39% of residents in the southern swing state voted for equal rights. Polling showed those opposed included more than 40% of Democrats and the majority of African Americans. While there is a difference between voting for a gay candidate and supporting marriage rights, the disparity between statements of support for a gay candidate and actual voting returns on gay rights are striking. Now, let me say this. Um, I, think, I think these are interesting points. Okay, because there is a difference between voting for a gay candidate and supporting marriage rights. It is, there is a difference. Because when you when you are voting, you vote for policy. 
you vote for the person's policy, you vote for, you know, their track record, based off their track record and stuff like that. Their personal life. I've said this before. It's not... President of the United States is not a... It's not a moral position. It's not a religious position. He's not the Pope. He's not a bishop. You know, it's not that. So most people view it as just, okay, who who has the best policies and who will benefit me the most? You know, and they, they talk about this young voter, this young voter part. Young voters, well, here's the thing. Here's what is on the minds of most young voters. Cost of, you know, cost of tuition, um, climate change, and, you know, health care. Things like, things like that. And so we're at a point where we look at these things and we say, okay, those are the things that are most important to me. And Sanders, you know, his, a big part of his success is young people because they see Okay, well, here's a guy where, you know, we're just going to be getting a bunch of handouts. How it's going to work? Oh, well, we don't know. What's socialism? Oh, we don't really know. But it sounds really good. And that's what it is. So it's 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 like age doesn't matter. To, I'm one of those people where age does matter. I, I do care about age because I look at, you know, I want the person in office. I want the person that's the most powerful person in the world to be healthy. If I'm if I'm in that country, I want my leaders to be healthy. I don't want them to ha- be at risk for a stroke or a heart attack or you know dementia. Which, by the way, by the way, and I'm not speaking. I'm not trying to say. I'm not saying I want this for Joe Biden, but I genuinely believe um, that Joe Biden may have dementia. I do believe that. I would. I would say gun to my, I would say, ah, God, I hate talking about this, but I'd say gun to my head and I had to pick yes or no, does Joe Biden have dementia? I would have to say yes. Just watching him speak, his gaffes, um, he, I, something, it's just something. But anyway, that's what, voters aren't concerned about age. They care about policy. They care about names and stuff like that. And remember, older generations are the ones who usually vote. See, young people, there's like the passion and stuff like that. But really, when it comes to voting, we don't do very well. We don't, we don't turn out to vote. So it's the old people that do matter. And here's the thing. The old people will, they are going to die before the younger people. Okay, so we do know that. Um, let me, let me get, let me get back into the article. Um, this gap between public statements and actual voting behavior are implied in other ways. Beyond asking people whether they they themselves are ready for a gay president, pollsters ask whether people think others are ready. The numbers always get worse in this formulation. In, in a Politico morning, uh, slash morning consult poll, 50% of those surveyed said they were ready to vote for a candidate, but only 40% thought others were. Because see, that's kind of the way it is. People tend to think that they... People overall have a better image of themselves than they do of others. Most people will say, okay, you know, I'm, you know, better than the average Joe. That's average, you know, John Doe or Jane Doe. That's usually what people will say. Because people want to feel good about themselves. And one way to feel good about yourself is thinking that you're better than others. We may do it unconsciously, but that's something that we do. These perceptions of others can be a a more informative window into people's thoughts. Two things are implied here. First, it may be an example of how people don't want to admit their own attitudes, but are willing to do so by blaming others. That's a good point. I'm not going to get into the rest of this article, but I encourage you to read this. It really, it makes you think. And I think that's one thing that's important. Whether you disagree or, uh, you know, agree with what the person says, you know, find find things that that make you think and make you question, you know, what you know, it just it just helps you become stronger and it helps you become uh, better. Um, this is from NBCNews.com. Again, the title is Pete Buttigieg dropped out of the presidential race, and homophobia helps explain why. Um, I would say just read it, and you know, you know, let me know what your you know let me know what your thoughts are. 
let me know. Um, but anyway, yeah, Pete's, Pete's out. And, you know, we're going to find out tomorrow what's going to happen. I'm going to have the TV on probably from the time I wake up. Like, seriously. Because here's the thing. Ulti- here's the thing. Ultimately, I know, or can't say no, but I'm very, very confident that Trump is going to win ag- again. I, I'd bet I'd bet money on that. Um, but I do want to see how close it is. I think it, I think it could be close. Cause here here's the thing, I believe California is going to go for Sanders. So I do, and I think whoever gets California, Bernie said it himself. You know, whoever gets California is very likely very likely to get the nomination. Remember, California has, what is it, 52 electoral votes? It's a huge number. But, you know, it's it's very important. And, you know, I'm I'm very excited for tomorrow, although I'm, I'm confident that whatever happens tomorrow isn't going to affect who's president. That's just me. Okay. Now, um, Texas mom um, has... Let me well let me start with this. I've talked about this topic before. How many of you as a child were spanked? How like how many how many of you and if you were how many times were you spanked and was it effective? Um I've said this before. You know, I've been spanked before. I was I probably received seven or eight spankings in my life. Um, they weren't effective. They didn't change my behavior. Um, I was, I was a good kid. I did. I didn't. I didn't get in trouble, really. Um, and I said this before that my theory with spanking, my belief is that spanking is really for the parents. Because what they do, you know, they're angry. They got to find a way to get out the anger. And so they just spank. And then um, you'll find that after they do it, they calm down and they're in a better state of mind where they can think clearer. Um, Because, you know, you know, um, one thing, one thing my dad always said when we were younger is like, you know, you know, I don't punish when I'm angry. But here's the thing. That wasn't true. When he spanked us because in order to, in order to hit something or someone, I'll say a person, in order to hit a person repeatedly, you have to be either, either you're playing a game and you're just, you're going bodies or stuff like that. Or, you know, you're at, you're actually mad at the person. You can't be happy and hit the person repeatedly. It's just, it just, that's not how psychology works so that's that's my belief but anyway there was this texas mom who was praised for using push-ups to discipline her son in a hobby lobby bathroom okay this woman takes discipline very seriously a mom from texas shared a photo on facebook of something she witnessed in the bathroom at a local hobby lobby a mom getting her son to behave by making him do push-ups all right Molly Wooden um, watched the situation unfold after taking her own children to the bathroom. The New York Post reports, according to her, she she was in awe of what she was seeing. She shared the photo to her Facebook page when she wrote, To the woman in the Hobby Lobby bathroom, if my hands weren't full of children, I would have applauded you. As your son gave you the back talk of the century, you stayed calm and collected while adding 10 more push-ups to his already growing number. Her post continued, we need more parents like you who aren't afraid of their own children because of what someone else might think. He said, Mama, this is the bathroom floor. Gross. She said, maybe you shouldn't have been acting obnoxious. They have soap for a reason. Ten more. Uh, she closed out her post by saying she loved the random woman of Hobby Lobby and encouraged her to keep raising them boys right. While the two moms didn't speak to each other in the bathroom, they eventually connected on Facebook. Nikki Harper Quinn found out about the photo when one of her friends found it and showed it to her. I was surprised it went viral, Quinn told the New York Post. I knew we were onto something and that this was bigger than me. 
it opened up a conversation and a debate that is making everyone think outside the box as far as discipline is concerned. Now, I think that this is interesting. Um, I, I'm familiar with this form of discipline. I, I, this didn't happen to me, but I do know, I do know, um, guys who they had to do, they had to do like push-ups or pull-ups as discipline. And like, if they talk back, it was like, okay, five more. And the parents would just keep on going and just stuff, you know, stuff like that. So I have seen this before. Um, I think, I think that this is, I think that this is interesting. Um, here's the thing. Here's the thing. Do I think kids today are more disrespectful than ever before? I would say so. I would say so. Cause I, I see some things that, you know, in the store, you know, four year olds, you know, cussing at their parents, calling their mothers and fathers, you know, the B word, um, or them saying, you know, F you. So I would say that parent, I mean, excuse me. Yeah. Parents are more disrespected today than ever before. I do believe that. I think you can make a serious case for that. Um, but I also say this one thing, my, one thing my mom talks about, you know, we'll talk about kids and we'll see kids in commercials like, you know, like little Pampers commercials. And, uh, you'll see that the, uh, the baby, you know, they they look all cute and stuff like that. And mom's like, yeah, but then they grow up and then they talk back. And, you know, let me say this about talking back. Um, words are perceived differently based off, you know, who on who it's coming to and where it's coming from. So kids will often say, okay, I'm not back talking to you. I'm explaining why I'm right. And let me say this. Let me say this. Um, let me, let me address parents first. No, let me address kids first. Kids, uh, and teenagers, sometimes parents are right. Not always, but sometimes they are. Parents, sometimes your children are right. And you think that just because you're the adult in the house, that your conclusion is correct. That is a stupid belief system. Sometimes you're right. Sometimes you're wrong. That's with everybody. And I do think that I do think that discipline, it's not really a thing anymore. And it's very, it's super, super important. And the, here's the thing about, you know, single, single moms, single moms, it's hard to discipline the boys because at the end of the day, and this may sound really sexist, this may sound really sexist. But boys will never respect their mother like they do their father. We love our mothers. But at the end of the day, we know we're going to grow up. We know that our mother physically, physically she can't do anything. She really can't. The only thing you can do is get us in our sleep. Or like do something to our food. But it has to be, you know, indirectly. It can't be through physical altercation. That's why... The parent, you know, the dad in the household, he's the enforcer. He enforces the rules because he can physically do something. The mo mothers can't really do anything. You know, you know, you kind of sometimes will hear the phrase from, um, from mothers, from single mothers or single fathers. They'll say, they'll tell their children, oh, I'm your mother and your father. No, you're not. You're only, you can only do what you are. You can, you can, you can only be what you are. If you're, if you're, a, if you're a woman and you have a child, you can only be the mother. You can't be the father. You can't teach boys about manhood. Fathers can't teach girls about womanhood. You can do your best. You can talk about, you know, you can talk about things from, you can only talk about things from the female perspective. Or you can only talk about things from the male perspective. We can try to get into the minds, but you can't, there's certain things that you cannot do because you are not in that area. Now, I don't know all, the, here's the thing. I don't know all the context of the situation. It may not have been back talk. It may have been back talk. I don't know. 
the post is really just about this mom applauding this other mom for disciplining her child and staying calm. I'm not going to say whether the kid was right or wrong because we don't know what he did. Moms usually side with moms. Kids usually side with kids. That's just that's just how it is. You you side with your peer group. So I I don't know. I just thought this was really interesting. Um. Now now someone I remember I talked about this in an early episode, and my my uh my friends. Well, not my friends, my family kind of makes fun of me because they know that I'm going to marry a white girl. And, you know, they were like, oh, yeah, you, you know, your wife's not going let to you, let you spank your kids. And I, I already wasn't going to spank my kids because spanking didn't work on me. It didn't, it just didn't do anything for me. It's just, and, it's, and here's the thing, especially if I especially have girls, there's no chance I'm putting my hands on them. I'm I'm not doing that. Um, but to me, you know, in form, in terms of discipline, there'd be other ways that I would do it. Um, but anyway, I just thought that this I thought this this article was interesting, but I do want to you know talk you know talk about this that parents sometimes your kids are right, kids sometimes your parents are right, and. Just and parents, just because you say something doesn't mean that that's final. It doesn't like just because you say it and just because you know it's like oh I pay the bills and stuff like that, so that means I'm right. All right. No. Because because there are a lot there are lots of people who try to do the right thing and they they're not they're not in a position of power. Adolf Hitler, and I'm, I'm not trying to compare parents to Adolf Hitler. I'm not doing that at all. But I'm just, just the idea of just because you have the power doesn't mean that you're right. Adolf, Adolf Hitler had the power, but he was one of the most evil men to ever live. Like he, like his things, his policies were horrible. So parents, respect your, respect your, uh, kids, respect your parents, love them. Um, parents, Love and respect your kids. You know, it's a two-way street. It can only, it has to work both ways. Okay. I want to get to Taylor Swift's new song, The Man. Okay. Um, I don't know if you guys have heard it. Um, it's called The Man by Taylor Swift. And I have to say that this, here's the thing, here's the thing. I used to have a crush on Taylor Swift. I, I still kind of do. She's, she's pretty. Um, she's sweet. She's nice. She's the, like, I, I just, you know, she's, she's, I think she's a pretty likable person. But my, 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 um, support of her and my, I would say my how how I view her has lessened. It's it's gone it's gone into a negative way, I should say. Um her music it seems to be getting worse. And I was I was Ben Shapiro talked about her song. And him and I share a lot of the same takes. Cuz he was talking about how um when the more political a song is, the worse it actually is. Cause see, cause see, here's the thing: music is for entertainment. That remember, that is for that's the main purpose. That's that that was that's why music was made to entertain. It was made to make us uh, feel good. That's the point of. That was that's why music was made. It was it's for entertainment and to feel good. The message is the message is important, but that's not the main reason. Okay. So her music is getting more and more political. She's artists now are just trying to get super woke. 
Like that's, it's almost like that's what it's about today. And this is why I don't listen to music made by my generation. I listen to music from the, you know, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s. Mostly, mostly 40s, 50s, and 60s. That's the, that's most of the music that I listen to. Because music back then was about, you know, the message, the message was good. It wasn't, it wasn't political. Stop making music that's political. Cause it's just, it, you're, it's, it's just bad. Like these lyrics suck. These lyrics are not good. Taylor Swift is kind of talking about how if she were a man, her life would be so much better. Um, I, I looked up, and this is according to Business Insider from uh, January of this year. I want you guys to guess. Don't use Google just yet. I want you guys to guess just how much Taylor Swift is worth. This is from January 31st, 2020. She is worth, it's estimated, and this is, this is probably pretty close, not, not, maybe not spot on, but I'd say this is close. $360 million. You know, what bothers me, what bothers me is when you have people that are at the top, people at the top, and they talk about oppression. Let me, let me say this. If you live in America... If you live in America, you are living in one in in the greatest country to ever exist. Ever. The way women are treated, the way minorities are treated. This is this is the best place. Why do I say that? Just look through history and just see how people were treated. See how people were treated in other countries. And when people, you know, when women talk about oppression, it's especially American women. They don't. It's they don't know the meaning of oppression. This this is this is the best country that's ever, that's ever existed. Women have never been treated better in any other place. But you have people still in 2020, and I talk about this all the time in the Middle East. They have to ask their husband for their blessing to to leave the house. Women are not allowed to leave the house. In certain countries, unless they have the permission of the man, or a man, or unless a man is with them, the man asks, "How long are you going to be out? Where are you going? Who are you going with?" They ask all these questions, and they still may get a no. Women can't wear what they want. It's 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 ridiculous, and you come over here to the United States, and it's like, "Oh my God, my life is so bad." Taylor Swift, listen. You're worth almost four hundred million dollars. Four hundred four hundred million dollars. If that dropped, if that dropped in my direct deposit tomorrow, if I woke up and I had four hundred million dollars in the bank, I'd be like, oh my god. Your life instantly improves and you go to the top. Money drastically helps. And one of, you know, one thing that feminism tries to push is just how bad it is to be a woman. Really? Okay. And let me, let me say this. If I was, See, here's the thing. If we're going to have a third wave, if we're going to have feminism, okay, let's talk about it in other countries, not the United States. There are women in other places in the world, they'd give anything to come here and suffer the quote-unquote oppression that women here suffer. Women own businesses here. They can wear what they want. They can live where they want. They can have sex with who they want. There are women who, who seriously, if they are just suspected of having an affair, they can be killed. 
I mean, it's ridiculous. I mean, it's it's really a slap in their it's really a slap in other women's face. You're saying, "Oh my God, look how bad my life is over here." You've got to be joking. You have to be joking. I just I I I don't I don't get it. I don't get it. Yes, I'm not a woman. I just I you know I just had this topic you know talking about how you know you can only be what you you can only be what you are. I don't understand womanhood. I understand manhood. But I can say this, I do understand history. And I know historically, women have never, ever, 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 ever been treated as well as they are here in this country. The things that they're allowed to do, the places that they're the places that they're allowed to go, the experiences that they're allowed to have. Wow. I just, it's it's just it's just absolutely ridiculous, and let me let me just read some of these lyrics to you. Um, let me say this: if you're a Taylor Swift fan, and you you you're a fan of the old Taylor Swift like me, don't don't listen to this song. Don't listen to this song. Okay, the man. I here we go. I'm not, I'm not going to sing it to the beat. I'm just going to read the lyrics. Okay, this is off Google.com, all right? I would be complex. I would be cool. They'd say I'd play the field before I found someone to commit to. And that would be okay for me to do. Every conquest I had made would make me more of a boss to you. I'd be a fearless leader. I'd be an alpha type. When everyone believes you, what's that like? I'm so sick of running as fast as I can, wondering if I'd get there quicker if I was a man. I'm so sick of them coming at me again. Because if I'm a man, because if I was a man, then I'd be the man. I'd be the man. I'd be the man. They, they'd say I hustled, put in the work. They wouldn't shake their heads in question of this, of how much of this I deserve. I'm, let, me, let me just stop right there. Let me just, let me just stop your headache there, okay? Um, and Ben Shapiro also brought up this point. And right, right when they got to these lyrics... I was thinking the exact same thing that Ben Shapiro was thinking. Michael Bloomberg, he he has he has been ripped in this election for people saying, "Okay, do you really deserve all that money?" Which is which is just ridiculous. Like, see, here's the thing. Here's the thing. People can be upset of, "Oh my God, you have that much money. Like, why do you deserve that?" Okay, what if a homeless person came up to you with no money? And they said, you know what? You don't deserve all your money. You would say, yes, I do. I've done this. I've put in the work. What is the difference? Just, okay, because people people just look at numbers and it's like, there's no way someone should have that much money. That's not fair. That's ridiculous. Why do you need that much money? Why do you, why do you need all those things? There's lots of things in people's homes that we don't need. We don't need television. We don't need the we don't need the latest iPhone. We don't need the latest Android phone. We don't need a pool. There's a lot of things that we have that we don't need. And here's the thing: with the more money you have, the more things you have access to. And it's, that's one of the benefits of having more money. And just being upset that people have a, just to you a ton of money and saying, "Oh my God, you don't deserve that." That's ridiculous. That's just wrong. It's just wrong. Michael Bloomberg deserves his money. When you here's the thing: if you follow the law and you do think you do things the right way, however much money you get, that's what you deserve. Jeff Bezos has changed the world with Amazon. Does he deserve his money? Yes, he does. And see, here's the thing. Here's what people don't understand. The, the amount of money that Jeff Bezos has doesn't, it doesn't limit the amount of money that you can get. See, that's what people don't understand. You have to look at things. Just because someone has this much doesn't mean you can't increase the amount you have. You know, you go back to the 20th century. 
you know, 19th and 20th century in the, in America, you had cultures that would come over and they'd start at the bottom and they'd work their way up. They didn't have to stay at the bottom. That's one thing, you know, black Americans, we talk about, we talk about, oh my God, you know, we're still at the bottom. It's just unfair. But it's like, okay, look at, you know, if you take the Chinese community, they work their tails off. The Irish work their tails off. The Irish used to be treated horribly. You know, every group at some point in history has been treated horribly. And they've had they've had good times. They've had bad times. It's amazing. But when you when you go when just because you start somewhere, and that's that's one of the beautiful things about America. You can start at the bottom and you can work your way up. Or if you're you can start at the top and you can fall to the bottom. It's amazing. It works both ways. That's that's so beautiful about America. There are many countries where for years and still today, if you're born in a, if you're born in a certain class, you stay there. No matter how good you try to do or how bad you try to do, you you would stay in that class. You can here you can work your way up. Or if you you know, you could fall down. That's possible. That's amazing. But I'm just, I'm just tired of, you know, music being politically focused. Art should never be politically focused. That's not like that's not what it's about. And I just, I just, it's just, it's just horrible, man. Like I can't imagine the music my kids are going to be listening to. Like I'm gonna I'm going to do my best. Like I'm I'm really gonna try to influence the music my kids listen to. Because music now like music now is so bad. And I like I would say that in ten years, when I'm thirty one, I would think that I'm going to have at least one kid, if not two. And I'm going to, tr- like, from the very get-go, like, I'm going to try to put them on the music that I listen to. The music from, you know, my dad's era. Because music back, music then is going to be horrible. And then they're just going to get older, and music music just gets worse. Music just gets worse. That's, that's the trend. So, the way, how bad it is now, dear God, just, just imagine... 2030. Just imagine that. So that's really all I want to say. You know, Taylor Swift, you are not oppressed. Women in the United States, you're not. You really put things into perspective. Put things into perspective. Just, I encourage you, look up some policies from Middle Eastern countries on how on what women are supposed to do what they can and can't do you would be stunned and you would immediately ask yourself or look at yourself and just say dang i have it really great here you're not you're not oppressed there's no there's no meeting there's no there's no there's no meeting where a bunch of men are just huddled together in these black hoods where you can't really see their faces and they're just huddled around this table, and there's candles all around them. They're like, "All right, fellows, how do we? What's how? How can we keep women down?" That's not a thing. That's not a thing. You're not. You're not oppressed. This this victimhood. I don't care. I don't care who it comes from. Men, women, um, ch- like children. You're not. You're not oppressed. We whine so much and our lives have never been, human life has never been better. I don't, it's amazing to me. It's amazing. The better your life is, the more whining you do. Like I just, I find that to be incredible. There are basic things that we don't have to worry about that people worried about for thousands of years. You know, freezing to death. You know, most people now we have, you know, homes that, you know, they stay warm. 
We have air conditioning. We have nice blankets. You know, people for many years, they had to worry about getting eaten by wild animals. We don't have to worry about that. Where can I go get fresh water? Where can I go get fresh food? I sure hope, you know, this food, you know, isn't bad. I, you know, we can save food. We have refrigerators. There used to be a time where you, if you got food, you had to eat it right then. Because you couldn't save it. Life, life is just, like seriously, look at the small things that we have. Oh my god. The, the, it's the little things that we just take for granted. Like, like, there are things that you don't think about. You have shoes that you can choose from to go outside and go about your business. There are people who have no shoes. They use empty water bottles and they try to tie them to their feet and use those as shoes. Pretty fashionable, isn't it? It's just, it's just absolutely ridiculous. And I'm, I'm tired of the victimhood from people. Especially Americans. Oh my god. It's, it's gross. It's absolutely gross. I can't stand it from anybody. Even if you're, I'm gonna say this. If you're homeless, that's sad. It, it is. It is. Being homeless is not a good thing. It's not good for the, it's not good for the mind. It's not good at all. But it, being homeless in America, compared to being homeless in other places, is Pretty is relatively pretty doggone good. It's just I just I just I can't stand it. I can't stand it. The world is safer. There's less crime. Your pro your, you know your property is safer. You are safer. You can walk the streets and be safer at night. Like my parents, I remember at my old church, and even my parents today, they were like you know. They're like, yeah, you know, you could just leave your front door open. You could leave it unlocked. And it's, it's like, let me, it's like, let me say this. Property crime is down. So whatever you guys did back then, we could do more so today. It's just, it's just ridiculous. No, I, I'm just, I'm just, life, life continues to get better for, for, for people in this world. There's less poverty, less hunger. There's more, you know, more wealth. People are living longer. I'm just, I'm, I'm sick, I'm sick of the victimhood, man. Like, it just, it's just, it's just gross. It's absolutely gross. Like, we just, we have to stop it. Cause let me, let me ask this. When, with, with victimhood. When you, when you just complain about how bad your life is, what does, what, like, seriously, seriously, what does that actually do? What do you actually accomplish from doing that? I'm, I'm sick of it. I'm sick of it. I just, you know, I was, I was looking at these signs at a Buttigieg uh, rally where, like, people were getting mad at him and people were like, you know, we're dying, you know. You know, represent us. You know, you know, you know, just stupid stuff. In the Middle East. And I, I know I reference the Middle East a lot, but, you know, these, like, these things are true. If you are just suspected of being anything other than straight, you can get thrown off a building just because of that. Just because, just because you're suspected. God, I, I, it's, it's sick. It's sick. It doesn't, it, victimhood, here's, the sad thing is, victimhood doesn't help anybody. See, just feeling sorry, when I've, it's like this, you feeling sorry for me doesn't help me. Me feeling sorry for you doesn't help you. Like, com like, complaining doesn't do anything. It's a waste of time. It's an absolute waste of time. That's one of the things I learned in the hospital. Just being angry and just being upset all the time. Well, that, that, it doesn't do anything. Your, your, your life, the, the timer of your life continues to count, the, it continues to count down. 
the sand continues to fall in your, in your, we'll call it our, you'll call it, we'll call it your life glass. Complaining doesn't do anything. Victimizing yourself doesn't do anything. This is, this is, this is America. You have so much to be grateful for. You have so much to look forward to. There's so much opportunity. There's businesses you can open up. You know, think just speech. You can say what you want. Like think, like think about that. We don't, we don't think about these things. We don't think about these things. We can say things about our government. We can say things about government officials that are negative. In China, you better not criticize the government. Do you even know what's going to happen to you? Dear Lord, you may, you may be walking down the street and you get nabbed in a car and no one ever sees you again. That's a real thing. You can criticize Donald Trump. Try going to China and criticizing President Xi Jinping. Let's see what happens to you. Be grateful. I'm telling you, I'm telling you, like it doesn't, you, you don't quite get it. People just don't, it, it's, we don't quite get it. See, we don't understand what we have until we lose it. You don't understand. That's why I talked about it earlier. You know, parents, love and respect your kids. Yeah, they're not perfect. But man, there are some people who would give anything to have children of their own. Children are, children are a blessing. You just got, you know, just raise them right. Parents, I mean kids, love and cherish and respect your parents. They do a lot for you. We are expensive. Humans are expensive. They do the best for you. They, you know, one of the reasons they go to work is primarily to take care of you. Make sure that you're fed. Make sure that you can, you know, you have somewhere to sleep at night. Make sure, you know, you have water, you know, you have water to drink. In a place to where you can go use the restroom. It's amazing. Like just be grateful for the small things. Stop complaining. Because let me tell you something. Something may happen one day. Where you can't quite. Where something's going to be gone. And you're not going to realize what you had until you lost it. It's the, it's the little things. And I'm telling you. Don't let it go away. For you to begin appreciating it. Just say thank just say thank you more often. When you wake up in the morning. Just tell God thank you. Cuz there are people who go to sleep and they don't wake up. That's a real thing. Be grateful that you're in your right mind. Be grateful that you know who you are, where you are, who you're looking at. There are people who don't know any of those things. They don't know who they are, they don't know where they are, and they don't know who they're looking at. They're just existing. I'm just, I'm telling you, just say thank you more often throughout the day. I'm telling you, you'll, you'll, your life will drastically improve. It, you will rewire your brain. We do so much complaining in this society and we have it so good. It's never been better. Anywhere. Anywhere. Stop complaining, I'm telling you.